All right, welcome everyone. It is Sunday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Time. It's time for Real Life Briefing version 2.0 with yours truly, Mark Callahan, Mr. Saltwater Tank, the webinar where I tell you about some book smarts and share with you a whole bunch of street smarts because as my college professors always reminded me, you're gonna learn a heck of a lot more out in the world than you ever will in the classroom. So that being said, what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about a second tank. Is that a new start? Is that a second love for you? Or a big giant pain in the ass? As uh, Tommy Callahan would say in Callahan Auto Parts, if you remember that movie, bonus points for you. All right, let's do a, a quick uh, just check in here. How many of you have more than one tank? Not had, but have one right now. If that's you, raise your hands. So I know if you have more than one tank right now, if you have more than one, raise your hand. A couple of you, building here, building, building. Okay, how many of you that have more than one tank are still married? Let's see if anyone's hands goes down. Really, a bunch of happy, shiny people here. Okay, that's good. All right, good, because look, let's face the fact. You may be thrilled about another tank and your spouse may have other things to say about it or you just get the silent treatment. Now, ladies, let's take the face the facts here. It is a male dominated hobby. Most of the stats I see tell us it's about 90% male, okay? So yes, it's a stereotype and for the saltwater aquarium hobby, it's pretty typical. If there's any lady reefers out there and this is switched for you, Look, I, I gotcha. I got to go with uh, the stats here. So again, this is a male dominant head hobby. In other words, if you could look around, you would see that it's a sausage fest. Now, your spouse, be it male or female, when you tell them, I want another tank, they're likely going to say, what's wrong with the tank that you have now? To which you can just say, you just don't understand. Now, here's the thing. Things don't have to be wrong for you to want a second tank. In fact, I say, why do things have to be wrong for you to want a second tank? In fact, you may want a second tank because everything is going so well. Or in the case of Mike who wrote in, he has five plus tanks. So in his case, everything's gotta be going really, really well for him to want to have that many tanks. And this happened exactly with me on my 450 gallon tank. Here is the frag tank that I added on to my existing system. It's a second tank. Um, wow, that seems like forever ago when that was, I took this picture, what, like three months ago? Uh, four months ago? So again, things don't have to be going wrong for you to want a second tank. And if things are going wrong and you want a second tank, but more power to you because you're not wanting to quit, you may say, you know what, this thing has just gone so wrong, let's just go get another tank, okay? So it can happen, but it doesn't mean that something has to be wrong for you to want a second tank. You may want a species tank. You love the hobby so much that you want more of it. This is happening to me right now with the water box sitting right over here that a client is uh, loaning to me. I will talk about that a little later on this evening. All of these animals are great animals for a species type tank. A species tank being one or two types of species of fish or seahorses or pipefish in here, and that's it. It's really just dedicated to them. It's like their happy place, and no one else really gets to play in that party. It's a great way to take to create a tank that's very specific for these guys' needs. In case of seahorses, I would tell you the only way I would ever run a seahorse tank is to have one plumbed into my existing system because seahorse tanks are a big pain in the tail. Seahorses don't digest the food very well. They create a lot of waste. You really want a small environment for them. It works great for a species tank. Mandarins, these guys are such picky, timid eaters it's a great reason to have them in a smaller tank. Now, I'm put a disclaimer on that. Hang on. A smaller tank that's just dedicated to them. That way, they don't have to compete for food. Same with the pipefish that's up here in the upper right. These guys are super cool. They're super small, and they're finicky eaters as well. So if you put them in a community tank, like with the mandarins and other big fish, tangs, wrasses, other things like that, they're going to get out-competed for food. Now, what about the old myth about a mandarin should only be in a really big tank, so there's lots of copepods to support the mandarin. Here's my take on that. 
The only way that I run a mandarin or have a mandarin species tank is if those guys are eating frozen or prepared foods. And a lot of the captive bred ones, the RA ones, are doing that. A lot of times in the diver sim, they say that they're eating prepared foods. And the other thing with mandarins is they're picky eaters. So they may eat prepared foods and then they may go off of prepared foods, but it's much easier to deal with that when they're in a small, dedicated system. So species tank is a great reason to have a second tank. Now, what if you got out and now you're getting back in? The second tank doesn't have to be all at the same time. Maybe you're in the hobby and then you got out for whatever reason and you missed it so much and you realize it's the only really cool hobby there is on the earth. So you, now you want to get back in. In other words, there is a gap. There's a gap in time from when you left the hobby and then when you got back in. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Look, everyone goes and wanders for a while and then they tend to come back, which is all right. Look, that happened to me. I got in in 1989. I got out probably, I think, about 1991. And then I got back in about 2007 and ended up on kind of my get back in tank. It's my 90 gallon tank. Great way to do this. This is a great reason to have a quote second tank. It doesn't have to be all at the same time. This can be your second saltwater tank in your whole saltwater tank career. And when you do that, sometimes you learn some hard lessons, like with me. What I knew back then, my first tank doesn't really apply to the second tank when there's a gap in time. Even if you're on a year, you'd be amazed how much things can change, especially now when there's so much inter information being shared on the internet. Case in point, the old undergravel filter, the underjoe undergravel filter. If you remember these, you remember that how cool you were was how many up tubes, the clear like one inch tubes, I think it was, that you put a penguin power head on the top with the little paddle like to direct the output facing up to get some breaking up the surface of the water. If you remember that, raise your hand so I know I'm not alone. If you had an undergravel filter with the penguin up tubes, okay, here we go. See, some people remember this. Yeah, that was it back in the day. Right, but look, that was outdated back then. No one really uses those anymore. Same with, you know, these. Metal halides. Now, I know, I know you can you can run a reef tank with metal halides. Just like you can get across the United States of America riding a bike. But we've evolved. We don't do that anymore. You can also type a letter to me on a typewriter. If you did that, I would be really impressed. How we did things back then is not necessarily how we do things now. So now you get to start all over and you get to learn what's new and what's different. This is very true with me and my 90 gallon tank. When I got my can, I said, I know how to do this. I went and rushed and bought another gravel filter. I didn't do any research because I knew what I was doing. And then I was like, I wanted to actually stop for a minute and did some research and talked to my local fish store. They're like, yeah, no one really does that way anymore. And then I learned about live rock because we really didn't have it back in the day. And I was like, oh, this makes a lot more sense. So the second tank is a way for you to get back into the hobby. And when you do it, I encourage you to do it with an open mind. You know things are different. You got to relearn some things, things like the nitrogen cycle that pretty much stays the same. But the point is, now it's a fresh start, not only for you and your tank, but also you and your mind and your mindset. And nearly all my clients did the same thing as that they were in the saltwater tank hobby for a while. They got out and now they're getting back in. So it truly can be a fresh start. It's really a chance to learn again and to take the gap and look, learn something. Now, the gap also doesn't have to be really long. It can also be very short. Maybe you're looking to get another tank quickly. You know, when you do this, this is a great time to remove the plague. That's a great time to start all over. When you are starting right over, especially if you have a small gap in time between your first tank and your second tank, this can be a great time to remove the plague. Plague being that stuff. Holstenzinia, you can't get it out. I know some people say it stays in a rock. Well, look, 99% of the time, the people I talk to, like, it stayed on a rock. And then it just suddenly showed up over here. And then it suddenly showed up over there. This stuff is going to survive COVID. Even if it gets it 10 times, it's going to survive the zombie apocalypse. You can't kill this stuff. If you are killing Holstenzinia, maybe you should try a freshwater tank. And if you kill things in a freshwater tank, this isn't the hobby for you. It's pretty, but it takes over. All right? I know. I, I get moves. I understand. And look, 
in disclaimer, ladies, I'm not being sexist here. Most of the time, the guys tell me that the wife wants pulsing xenia because it pulses and it moves. I admit it's kind of cool. I've seen it in the wild, and I'm like, oh, look, pulsing xenia. I hope it doesn't take over this whole great barrier to breathe. Look, I get it, but when you're moving your tank, when you're getting a bigger tank, you're getting a bigger tank, you're getting into your second tank, it's a great time to get rid of this crap. All right, this stuff too. GSP, another thing that's going to get COVID 10 times over, and it's going to survive and be asymptomatic and keep growing. You can't get rid of this stuff, especially once it's encrusted on a rock. So if you're quickly going to another tank, it's a great time to get rid of it. And sometimes our fin friends, look, they got to go too. Damsels are really hard to catch. There may be other fish that are hard to catch in your tank, but when you drain the ocean, they got nowhere to hide. They may hide in a piece of live rock. That's easy. You just take it out and you go, <laughs> you're gone, and you put them somewhere else. So when you drain the ocean, they got no time to hide. If you're quickly going into your second tank, it's a great time to get rid of these things. And you may want to keep some other stuff as well. Now, just talking about livestock would leave out another big piece of the picture. Just going to your second tank, getting rid of the plague as I'm talking about. The gear can be the plague. That undergravel filter that worked for years, and now you know you don't want it. When you're getting to your second tank, it's a great time to get rid of it. Or if you want to get rid of some metal halides. Look, here's the fact. You don't have to tear down your tank or get a second tank to remove metal halides. But I won't tell your spouse, I promise. I won't tell them. It's a great, if you can sell them on the reason for you to get another tank because you have to get rid of your metal halide lighting, look, more power to you. Maybe it'll work for you. Point is, whether it be livestock, whether it be gear, getting into your second tank is a great time to just get rid of it and move on because you're smarter now. You can get rid of all that junk that you started with in your first saltwater tank because you were just trying it out, wanting to see how it goes. Like, I'll just buy some cheap stuff, I'll start small, and see how it goes, and then decide if I want to go from there. Case study. Check this bitchin' saltwater tank out. Now, nothing wrong with this. This can work. This is just for an example. Off Craigslist in my local area. 20-gallon saltwater tank. It's got a straight-up power head on there, a hang-on-back filter. Looks like some Texas holy rock and black sand. Can it work? It can work, but you know what? It happens to all of us. This person should be in this webinar. This tank, it says freshly built. Next line, decided to go bigger. Boom, it happens to everybody. Yeah, this person should be here listening. Maybe they are listening to this talk. You're just down the road for me. Okay, what am I talking about? I'm talking about upgrading. Everyone's favorite topic, getting a bigger saltwater tank, I can speak to it, I've done it several times, I'm doing it right now. Your second saltwater tank can be an upgrade. And look, we always hear about bigger can be better. You don't have to have a huge tank. You can be going from a 30 to a 60. It's gonna be better. Point is, make your upgrade worth it. Look, don't just go small. Here's an example. 55 gallon tank, the tank that everybody has had. And then you want to go, hmm, I'm going to make a big upgrade. I'm going to make an upgrade to a 90-gallon tank. It is also 48 inches long. Here's the thing. When you go from a 55 to a 90, it sounds like almost double the water volume. But when you set the new tank there, it's going to look a little bit bigger. But it's not really going to feel that much bigger. If I'm going from a 55-gallon tank to a 90-gallon tank, if you're considering that, here's my advice. Don't do it. Go bigger. In this scenario, if I was going from a 55 I would go to a 180. That may sound like tons more water volume. It's actually not. 80, 180 gallons is a nice, what I call, small, big tank. To me, it's like the break into the bigger tanks. It's 72 inches long across the front, which is a lot more meaningful for your upgrade. So if you're thinking about upgrading for your second tank or you're thinking about your next tank, the point is don't just think about water volume, think about dimensions. You're gonna get a heck of a lot more out of a 72 inch long upgrade from 48 than just going from 55 gallon to a 90 gallon tank. Here's the thing, we've talked about this a lot. In six months, it will feel small. My experience tells that with me, myself, and talking to all my clients, nearly every one of them, I put in their tank day one, they're like, this is great, I've got all this space. Within six months, they're like, yeah, 
doesn't seem so big anymore. It happens every single time. So make your next tank worth it when you're going to make the jump. Make your upgrade worth it. I will say this, I've said this almost every week because I want to drill it into your heads. If you're making the upgrade, make the upgrade worth it. All right. Now, not everyone is upgrading or getting a second tank and losing the first tank. You may want multiple tanks, like Mike. He has five plus tanks. Um, Mike, if you're single and you're looking for a special lady, and if you're a single lady on this webinar and looking for that special guy who's in the reefing, you two may want to talk. Here's the thing about multiple tanks. One becomes second best and gets ignored, and that's when it's a pain in the tail, especially if one is much smaller or an all-in-one. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you can avoid this by a little catch that I'll talk about in just a second as well. Why would you add a second tank when you already have a tank? Now, here's the thing. If your spouse isn't into this idea, you may want to take notes on this. A species tank. A great way to run a species tank is to tie it into your existing system. Or a frag tank, because things are going so well in your saltwater tank that now you want to cut coral and grow it out in a frag tank. Or you want to give it away, or maybe you want to sell it. These are all great reasons to add a second tank or more to your existing system. The point here is absolutely whenever you can, the by, by far the easiest way to do this is to tie it into your existing system. This will make your life very, very easy. But even if you have to go under the house and drill some holes, crawl through a crawl space, punch out some drywall to do it, to run a pipe, do it. It will be worth it. Do it. Do it. This is what I did with my frag tank. You can see here's the water line. This is the intake line. Um, let's call it the return line for the tank. Uh, coming in here, this is just teed off my main return line going into my 400-gallon, 450-gallon display. So this water is pumped into this tank from my sump, and then it drains into my sump as well. It just added water volume to my existing system. I don't have to have any special gear in terms of skimmers or return pumps or top-off for this tank. Other key with this is, and I hear this is my smaller frag tank because, you know, if you can have one frag tank, why not have two? I wanted to maximize my space in the fish room. I'm still not up to Mike with five tanks, but hey, five plus tanks. Got to give you credit there, Mike. Again, we have a water line coming in and then a drain line dumping back into my song. If I'm running a frag tank, this is the only way I would do it because small tanks are harder to keep things stable, especially for a frag tank where it needs to be super stable for you to grow coral. So if you tie it into your existing system, you get all that water volume already. Your protein skimmer, which is probably much bigger, it's gonna work better because bigger protein skimmers work much better than those small all-in-one nanotype skimmers. So there's an easy way for you to keep a frag tank. It'll make your life much easier. Do water change on your big tank. The, water, the frag tank gets water change. Whatever the water parameters are in your big tank, the frag tank has the same parameters. That makes it easier for you one, in terms of maintenance, but also when you go to move coral, you don't have to worry about acclimating it to the new tank, to your main tank. All you got to do is just pick it up and move it over, and it's good to go. Now, this is me on a smaller scale. Some guys take it to the next scale. Uh, this is old Dave down in Utah. Uh, these are his frag tanks, which are tied into his existing system. Uh, I think these are basically harvest crates, I think is what they're called. They're roughly four feet by four feet by three feet, I think. Um, so he tied all these into his existing system. There's his display tank uh, there in the back. So all this is tied together and it makes for lots of cool frags and he can keep fish in there as well. When his fish in his big tank uh, go and get evicted, then he just chunks them over into the frag tank and it makes it very easy. Tying your tank into a new system. Here's the thing though. Just because you're adding a tank doesn't mean that it's not gonna change anything into your system. It, it can add, change things significantly in your existing tank. For example, you may require upgraded gear, such as a skimmer. If your protein skimmer is rated for 200 gallons and you add a frag tank, which takes you up to say 300 gallons, you may need a bigger protein skimmer because you now have more water volume. Now, some people say, well, hang on, Mark. What if I'm not putting any fish in the frag tank? Well, 
you're still going to need a bigger skimmer because at some point the pollution for say caused by your display tank is going to be the same in the frag tank and then you're going to have more water volume that you have to skim so yes even though you're not putting fish in the new tank you still need to check out and make sure your skimmer is going to fit it's going to be rated for your total system volume after you add on this tank your mini reactors if you need to run carbon or gfo if you add in the extra water volume you may need bigger media reactors to hold more media to help you process the added water that you've done you're probably going to need more lights i've yet to see anyone add another tank to their system and not put lights over it so you're probably going to need a light that goes on that system now here's the thing for those of you that are wanting to do a frag tank put the same lighting on the frag tank that's on your display tank. This makes acclimating corals to your display tank easy. All you do is take them out and then plop them into your display tank. I wouldn't even worry about where you place it in the display tank versus frag tank and par ratings. As long as the spectrums are the same, the schedules are the same with the two tanks, just keep it simple and just move it over. Now, return pump. Why would you need a bigger return pump if you add a second tank? Because you're bleeding off some flow by pushing water over into that second or more tanks. This happened to me on my build. For example, I had the Ecotet Marine Vector L1. That worked great for just the sump and my 450 gallon tank. And then when I added my frag tank and then added another little frag tank, I needed more flow. So then I went to a Red Dragon 230 watts and I just went ahead with the high pressure pump because it wasn't that much more money and then I had that capabilities. Now this is one nice thing about a DC pump over an AC return pump. If you're not at the end of the capabilities of that DC pump, if you add in a second tank, all you may need to do is to turn up the flow on your DC pump and that may cover you. If you're adding multiple tanks or a larger tank that's adding onto your existing system, you may need to go and get yourself a bigger return pump as well. All right, all things to keep in mind when you're adding a second tank into your system. Now, I talked, I said earlier we would talk about species tank. Hey, you love the hobby so much, you want more of it, but now you want to create a very specialized environment that's just for a specific animal that you're wanting to keep. Such as seahorses, pipefish, and mandarins. Love species tanks. It's so much fun just to create a special home for these animals and give them environments that they like. The Dragonfish like to hang out in seagrass, so now you can keep that in your species tank because your tanks aren't going to mow it down or it's not going to get blasted by flow. You need a lower flow tank like for seahorses. You can do that because you don't have to think about flow needs of coral. This is the species tank just for these guys. It's literally just their happy hidey home, and all that matters that happens in this tank is what's into it in terms of that species that you're keeping. Now, keep in mind, this can be for coral too. If you had a non, if you want to create a non-photosynthetic tank, your second species tank could be for coral. Maybe you have some big aggressive fish in your display tank. It was a fish only. You decide you want a reef. So then the second tank that you're adding on, well, now that's your species tank for coral. It can work. So species tanks. I'm going to kind of rope in frag tanks here as well. They're usually a smaller system. Especially for those pipefish, seahorses, and mandarins, they work great in a smaller type tank. The thing about this is smaller gear usually isn't so bueno. For example, skimmers, media reactors, they're okay, but they're not really that good on a small scale. Those of you that have smaller tanks, you've experienced this. For example, every nano skimmer that I've ever had, it skimmed okay. It didn't really do that well especially when I was used to a large skimmer and in some skimmer that worked really well on a bigger system. Therefore, if you're doing a species tank, by all means, tie it into your existing tank whenever you can. Again, go through that effort and do it. For example, here's a project I'm working on now for a client. We're putting in a new display tank in his basement. And when I started looking at the space, I said, you know what, we really have room for another tank over here on the side. That way you can sit at your wine bar and you can see one aquarium so you don't have to walk around the corner to look at your display tank. And we're going to tie this other little tank. And to give you reference, the big tank is 400 gallons. This other little tank is going to be a 75-gallon tank. 
it's basically going to be a clown harem type of tank is the current idea. But it's tied into the sump between them, so he doesn't have to do any special water changes on that smaller tank. It's all the same parameters throughout the system. It keeps it really, really simple, which is really great advice, even if Dwight's not so much into it. Keep it simple, stupid. I say this all the time. Look at something, design it out, and then look at it and go, how can I make this easier? Easiest way to do it, step one, is to hide into your existing tanks. Now, not all of you may be able to do that. I understand, it doesn't work for everyone. And if that's you, you're going to have multiple separate tanks. Yikes, I say that, especially from experience right now, because I have one, two, three, four of them in this room right now. They're all separate tanks, none of them are tied together. So when I do water changes in here, I have to do a water change on this tank, that tank, that tank, and that tank, and then to fill each one up uh, individually, test all the water parameters between all them. It's not much fun. I'm only doing it right now because this is all temporary holding tanks until I get the new one up. Now, one thing that I found with this, a little hidden gem in me, part of this whole upgrade process with me is that water box sitting over there that I've been kind of hinting to all night. That's a 30 gallon water box. This for me is, I, this week I made it into a species type of tank. It's kind of a quasi species tank, really. I looked at it and I said, you know, that's a fun little tank. It's not that big, it's got a sand bed. There's no aggressive fish in there. Let's go get myself a pearly headed jawfish. One popped up on my Aquarius Diver's Den. I said, that little water box is a great species tank for that jawfish. And it's worked out really well this week. He's already dug himself a home over a little bit of a little live rock that's in there. There's no coral in that tank, so I don't have to worry about him toppling stuff. He's happy. He comes out, he looks around, he takes some sand, throws it at a fish who might be swimming by. And it works because it's a small tank. So he has this little environment. I don't have to try to find him in this big display, like my big thousand gallon reef when I set it up, even my 450 gallon reef when I had it. Probably wouldn't put a jawfish in there because it's gonna be like, where in the heck did he go? Then if he sets up camp behind a rock, in the back of your tank, you're like, well, I'd like to, to see you, but I can't, I don't know where you are. So this has become my little species tank. It doesn't have to be just a seahorse, a pipe fish, and the mandarins like I talk about. You can do it for other nano types of fish. This is my curly headed jawfish species tank. I'm really enjoying it at the moment. So multiple separate tanks can work. Just be aware of the maintenance headaches and keep this true fact in mind. One becomes second best. One of those tanks doesn't do as well or you decide you're not as into it. It becomes second best, your main mug, your main reef. And when it becomes second best, it gets a cold shoulder, literally like, yeah, whatever, I'm gonna go look at this. And uh, then you don't pay attention to it. And then things tend to go downhill and then you end up breaking it down because you don't really care for it or you know you're not taking care of it. This always happens. It happens every single time with anyone I've ever talked to. And this always happens with all-in-one tanks. All the clients I've ever worked with that have had an all-in-one or an out-of-the-box type of system, they've always said, it was okay, but, and there's always a but, and there are a couple things that they just didn't like about it. Now they will say it got them started, and then once they learned some things, they formed their own opinions, then they were ready to move on. So an all-in-one, I don't wanna diss them too hard because they do have their place, just be aware if you're looking at one, you're probably gonna to wanna to move through it pretty quickly. And you may not be able to with an all-in-one, but the main thing I want to leave you with is you're looking at a separate tank is by all means, whenever you can do it, tie it into your existing system. Now, here's some fun inside information for you guys and girls who are with me tonight. This room is our dining room. Just now my office and the temporary holding tanks until the addition is done. But the big tank behind me, that's a seven foot tank, that will go away. It's too big for this room because in time, the dining room table is gonna come back in this room. But I like the idea of having a tank in the main level of my house. So this will go away and then a smaller tank is gonna go in here. I'm not sure on the size. It's probably gonna be a 90 or less. Maybe it's a four foot tank, maybe it's a three foot tank. The point of all this is, I'm already started looking at how I'm gonna do this. 
the new tank, my second tank in my house, will get tied into my existing system at some level. Maybe I don't run the water through it in the sense that I don't have piping from this tank over into my sump and then a return line up into this tank so that it has the same water parameters, the same, all the water is mixing between this tank and my upstairs tank. At the very least, I'm gonna run water lines in here so I can do automatic water changes, um, or I'm gonna run a water line so if I wanna do a water change, then I don't have to haul a hose through my garage to get water into this tank. So that's kind of a quasi second tank. If I can, I wanna plumb this thing into my main display so it's all one system. The point is, even if it's going to be a separate tank from your main display tank, at some level, tie it in to your existing system, whatever that looks like. Even if you're just tying into the mixing station, you're gonna be happy that you did it. Keep it simple though, you don't have to be overcomplicated. By all means, tie it in when you can. All right, that being said, let's flip over to questions tonight. You can write them in the text window if you don't want to um, talk live. If you want to talk live, raise your hands. Uh, <clears throat> and let's see, who has a question? Oh, all right. I started down towards the end of the alphabet because those people never got to pick first. They always started at the top in elementary school. All right, Tim A, you're on, buddy. Make sure you unmute your mic and uh, quit the screaming dog. Hi, Mark. I had a uh, question because last week and then this week you brought up upgrades in at 90 gallons. Um, and I'm just wondering why 100 gallons is not really the, the number. Is there some type of dimensional thing about 100 gallon tanks? Uh, you know, the 90, I don't really see that many hundreds right now, Tim. You know, the 55, the 75, the 90, the 120 are all more common sizes. Um, you know, I mean, if it was a 90 or 100, it's very much that the dimension across the front is going to be the same. So, I mean, it, to me, it's it's just a 90, it's just a nice, nice reference size for me. Um, nothing wrong if you wanted to go 100. I would still just apply the whole rule about, don't just think about it in terms of water volume, think about it in terms of length. Make the length on your second tank bigger, significantly bigger, so that it's actually worth it. Nothing wrong with 100 though, there's 100 and 105. Um, but again, think about it more in terms of dimensions, then you think about your next tank as a terms in terms of water volume. Dimensions are more important to me than water volume. Great question. All right, while we're down here, let's take Tim. Tim L, have at it, buddy. Are you with us, Tim? He's unmuted himself. Oh, his hands back up. Yep, that's you, Tim. All right. Tim seems to be uh, having audio issues here. We'll jump up to the top of the alphabet. Those people are always pick first. All right, Bruce. Bruce, have it, had it. I can't talk. Have at it, Bruce. Take it away. Oh, hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm well, um, how are you? Doing well. My question actually isn't so much about having um, an extra tank. I already have three of them. <laughs> but oh. um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not able to connect them the way the family room's set up. But in the one tank, I'm having problems with hair algae and it's kind of driving me crazy. Um, my phosphates have, since I cycled the tank about a year and a half ago, has generally been zero. My nitrates have generally been zero, but my phosphates have kind of ranged from 0 0.08 to 1.3. And so I'm kind of thinking it's the phosphates that's causing the problems, but I, I wanted to get your advice. All right, Bruce. So we're talking about second tanks for the moment. So let me circle back around for you um, so okay. I, can, I can keep things on topic. So. Um, Thanks for the question. I just want to keep talking about second tanks at the moment. Let's see who has more questions. Remember, if you don't want to talk live, you can also write in a text question and I can take those as well. All right, Nicholas, Nicholas L, unmute yourself, Nicholas. You're currently muted and uh, fire away. So uh, thanks for uh, having this series again. And hope, hope everybody here is, is doing well. Um, two questions for you, one related. Um, if your uh, second tank is connected to that, um, what, uh, 
what can you do as far as sizing goes um, with an existing sump? Um, can you double the size of the tank on an existing sump? I currently have a 300 uh, with a C bash or ba excuse me, bash C uh, 60. I was okay. thinking about adding another tank similar size, just a longer one. Um, is that possible? Or would I really need to upgrade that sump? The other is, is I have a question about um, quarantining dragonettes uh, prophylactically to, to, to get rid of ick and velvet and how to do that trying to feed them pods. Okay, so let me talk about your second tank question. Then Nicholas uh, and last guy I talked to as well, if you fire your, um, let's call it off topic questions for the moment, um, off in, a, in the text screen, that way I can make sure uh, that I get to it as okay. well and I don't forget about you. So, but let's talk about, Nicholas, let's, let's talk about, can you add on a tank and then what about your sump? So, the thing about it, I see a lot of people, mistakes made about sump is they just think about, I need so much water volume in it. The size of the sump for me and a lot of my builds are mostly dictated by what's going to go in it in the terms of protein skimmer, and meter reactors, and then the return pump. Now, if you're going from, you're adding more another tank onto your system, you have to think about, are you gonna need a bigger protein skimmer? And when you need a bigger protein skimmer to handle more water volume, they very likely get bigger in size. Now, you may get lucky and they just go taller and not that much wider, but you need to see if that new protein skimmer, if you even need one, will fit in that existing sump. If your new gear that you need for what you're adding on will still fit in your existing sump, look, have it, keep the sump that you have. You don't need to get a bigger sump just because you're adding more water volume. It's more about what are you putting into it um, that's going to maybe dictate more gear that therefore won't fit in your existing sump. A lot of the, I see a lot of people make mistakes thinking a sump has to be a certain size in terms of water volumes. Water volume sump, uh, sump size in terms of water volume to me is really secondary. I think more about what space do I have, what needs to go in it, what size do I need for like the skimmer chamber? And then do I need extra room to work with? I mean, a lot of my sumps, I couldn't even tell you how many much water volume is in them because uh, it doesn't really matter. It's more about um, uh, what's got to go in them and do I have the physical space because you can't mess with physics. Uh, that's how I think more about my sump. So your question, if you need more gear, will the new gear that you need for the bigger tank that you're adding on still fit in your sump? If so, Run with it. All right, Jeff. Jeff D, you're up, buddy. Have at it. Got to unmute yourself, Jeff. There we there go. go. I figured out how to unmute. Cool. Um, all right. So this comes from the picture that you showed of that first frag tank that you added on in. I noticed you had one of the Neptune flow sensors on it. Uh, been, I'm going through putting a new build in my house right now, and I've seen mixed reviews. Yep, that exactly. Um, going to have my main display as a 220 and then a frag tank in the basement. Sump will be in the basement as well. Uh, what has your experience been on those flow sensors? People have said that they will restrict flow, that they get clogged and become a failure point. You have one on. Love to hear your thoughts on it. All right. Great question. So what's my thought on these flow sensors? Number one, um, I use them just to know if water is flowing. I'm not as concerned about the number that they're giving me. For example, on this frag tank, I think the flow number that it was giving me was somewhere from what I remember, like around 150 gallons per hour. I never sat there and was like, is 150 gallons an hour enough for this frag tank? What I was more concerned about was if I saw any kind of flow reading, then I knew that there was actually water going through my system and that my return pump was working. So I actually set up my alarm on my apex to tell me that if this flow drops, then send the alarm because one reason that flow might have dropped is because my return pump died. So that's how I like to use the Neptune flow sensors. Now, is the number useful? It is not only in terms of an alarm if water is flowing, but also to get some kind of idea of a baseline for that number. If it's 160 and then 150, like, okay, there's some variance in these things. If it goes from 160 to 80, either the sensor, the flow sensor is getting clogged and getting dirty and needs a cleaning, or maybe there's something wrong with your return pump and it needs a cleaning. So 
once I know about where it likes to stay as a range, then I also set an alarm or if it dropped much below that, let me know as well. My algorithm, my experience now, you talked about uh, restricting flow. Okay, like, so what? People get so bent out of shape about restricting flow. If you're doing it majorly, true, uh, true fact, I have seen builds where it had a, the return pump um, was one and a half inches output and then the final line into the tank was three quarters of an inch. And they carried that three quarters of an inch line all the way down nearly to the where the return pump started. Okay, in that case, and that's an extreme example, that's a lot of flow, that kind of restriction, that's a red flag to me. But the little amount of restriction that may, that may happen going through this flow sensor, like, so what? It's not gonna make a difference in your tank. If you're that concerned about it, you probably have a DC pump turn it up a notch and you'll be fine. One thing I will say in my experience with the flow sensors is, I tend to like the one inch ones over the two inch ones because if you look at that picture, all those screws all the way around that flow sensor, you can take those out and then take out the impeller, scrub it down with a toothbrush and put it back in. I found that this sensor would stop working in the sense that it would stop giving me a reading about once a quarter. And I knew what it did, I can be like, okay, very likely that return pump hasn't died. And hold that thought, I'm gonna show you a little fun bit of inside information that I use as well. It's like, okay, it needs to be cleaned, turn off the flow, take the thing apart. It took me like less than 10 minutes to clean the thing. It's super easy. <clears throat> and then it would start working again. All right, so since you jogged my memory, uh, let's go have a look at my Apex dashboard and show you a fun little trick. If you don't have a flow sensor and you have the orange gray apex, it requires the orange gray apex, here's a fun way to know if water is flowing. Now I would do this with my flow sensor. The flow sensor died, I would get an alarm and say, hey, the flow has stopped, it's really low. Because I had an alarm that was, it was like under 100 and then I had another one if it was under 10. If it was under 10, either my flow stopped or the sensor was dirty and it stopped giving me a reading. So what I would do is go, oh, okay, I have an alarm, flow is per se dead, let's go look. And I would go into my main energy bar here. Oops, that's the second energy bar. So here's my main one. Here's my uh, return pump reading right here. And I could look at this and say, oh, it's drawing power. It's very, very likely that this pump is drawing power and therefore it's pumping water into the tank. It's been my experience 99% of the time if the pump is drawing power, it is pumping water. So even if the flow sensor set it died, then what I do is I would go in here to my return, my main 832 where my return pump is plugged in, and I would make sure that thing is drawing power. So the flow sensor wasn't as concerned about the flow. I just wanted to see that there was flow going through it. And then if it died, I went into my main energy bar. Now, this only works with the energy bar 832. It doesn't work with the old black energy bars. This is another reason I like uh, I like the new Apex. I'll upgrade clients to it because I can get in here and I can see this remotely and they can see it as well. I get more of an insight for what's going on with my tank. So I like the flow sensors. If nothing else, I use them so I know that water is flowing. It gives me peace of mind when I'm not around. Great question. That was a long answer, um, but you jogged my memory on that. So. Um, I hope that was helpful. All right, let's see who else has a question. All right, Patrick. Patrick is uh, on his phone. So Patrick, let's get this thing to work. Patrick, are you with us? Yep, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm off. I have about uh, two independent independent tanks. I have a Red Sea Max Nano that I had for about a year and a half now, right? And I recently picked up um, Red Sea Max. C130, which is a 34 gallon, right? So with the 20 gallon tank, I've been trying to keep it manageable, doing 10% water changes once a week, right? So now that I added this other tank, I'm thinking the same concept. When I do my 10% on the 20, I'm gonna do 10% on the 34. Is that really gonna be enough for the 30, doing a 10% once a week for the 34 gallon? Like, is that something, like, it's kind of manageable for me, but do I, is that going to be enough for that volume of water, 10% once a week? You don't have them tied together, right? No, I don't. They're independent. Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing about 10% is if you're 10% of 30 or 10% of 300, 
either way you're doing 10 percent you're getting the same dilution factor or the same element replenishment factor so yeah i mean 10 percent is a nice number if that works for you with my tanks i did five percent a week because that was just easier for me i started back my own 90 gallon tank because i could get a five gallon jug a five gallon jug water change once a week was five percent of the water change I just found that works for me, Patrick. If 10% works for you, like run with 10%. Um, do that's a little bit of learning to listen to your tank. Do what works for you. All right, let's go over to some text questions. The shy crowd. Um, Jeffrey has a question. It says the second tank is 200 gallons. It's not set up. What are you waiting on, buddy? Uh, how long can the tank be dry before it needs to be resealed before I set it back up again? Great question. All right, Jeffrey, you have a 200 gallon tank. It's going to be dry for a while. Unless we're talking like years and the thing is sitting in like a hot or cold storage unit, getting in not the best environmental conditions, I'm really not worried about it. You know, does silicone dry out? Probably. I'm not a tank builder, so I can't speak to that. I don't produce silicone. But I mean, it's not like every tank that they make and then goes to your local fish store. Or even if you buy it online, it's not like it gets built one month and then immediately delivered to you. So if you're concerned about it, I mean, I would, if it was two or three years, I'm still not concerned about it. I know plenty of people that buy a tank because they're going to start building stuff, getting they want to get everything together before they set it up. Not my approach, but again, this is how they done it. And the silicone is still fine. Bottom line is I would look at the silicone. If you see a bunch of cracks in there, um, if you, you push on the silicone, it should be slightly stringy. Um, that's fine. Jeff wrote in and said it's been five years. Again, Jeff, check the silicone. If it looks cracked to you, then I'd be concerned. If it doesn't give a little bit, it's still firm, but it should give a little bit um, when you touch it. All that's fine. I wouldn't think about tearing apart the tank just because it's been five years and you feel like it needs to be resealed. Um, if I was that concerned about it, I wouldn't personally tear apart a tank. I would just get another one. Um, tear, redoing it yourself, good luck. It's probably going to end up in disaster, and it's a heck of a big pain in the tail. All right. Howard wants to know, what's the easiest way to frag a tank into a, a frag? How do you plumb, plumb is a verb here, plumb a frag tank into an existing tank? All right, Howard, a couple ways to do that. One, you simply put a T in your return line that's going to your main display, and on that T, part of it leads over to your frag tank. That's the easiest way to do it. Now, the catch with that is, I would put a valve, a ball valve, you don't necessarily need a gate valve, you get yourself a ball valve that's gonna go on the line over to the frag tank. Because water's gonna take the easiest path. It's gonna be easier for it to go through the T into your frag tank most likely than it is all the way up and into your display tank. So you may need to restrict water going into the frag tank, and you do that with a ball valve to get, therefore you get enough water up into your display. And you may not want all that force of that water coming out from your return pump going into that frag tank. So it gives you some flexibility by simply putting the T in and then putting the ball valve. Now, you may not have enough flow on of your return pump, you may not want to take that plumbing project on. The other way to do it is to get yourself another return pump. Here's the key, if you have the space and you can have a second return pump for the frag tank, that's the same size as your main display tank's return pump, then you've got an immediate backup. That's gonna make things very easy for you in case one dies, you can swap it. But the key here is get them DC because you don't wanna blast 2,000 gallons an hour to your frag tank like you might be blasting 2,000 gallon an hour into your display tank. Two easy ways to do it. Um, if you really got some plumbing skills and you have the capabilities, you can have your main tank drain into your frag tank, but then drains into your sump. Chances are, if you're that skilled, you got that much um, capability to do it, you're probably doing pretty much a rebuild as opposed to just adding on a second tank. Good luck with the frag tank, Howard. Um, they're always fun. All right. Same. Eric had the same question. All right, Howard. Um, that's how I'd plumb it in. Let's see here. Anthony wants to know, I get this question a lot. Do I have any issues keeping temps consistent through both tanks? Uh, the answer to that, Anthony, is no. 
it's all the same water volume. Water is moving through one tank into the other tank, so it's not like one tank is 80 and the other tank is 76 because it's all one water volume. Maybe one slightly warmer than the other. Even if it's, I mean, it shouldn't be more than two degrees because water is moving so quickly through there. The water is going to mix up. Um, it's not something I would be concerned about either. If some clients want to put probes in all these different tanks, make sure they're all the same and like close enough, then you're going to get into an error kind of a standard deviation of error on these different probes. You're splitting the hairs. It should be fine. Uh, great question uh, about that. All right. Let's see here. Uh, let's go back to the text or to the live questions. Oh, Robert, Robert, you read this nearly every week, buddy. Thanks for coming back. Robert, why? We're talking, make sure you unmute yourself, Robert. We're talking second tanks here. Have at it, buddy. Hey, Mark. Thanks for hosting us again tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, love the idea of the second tank. And uh, I guess technically this is my second after a 15 year hiatus. Huh? Join the club. I'm hoping things go well enough that I get to the point of needing a frag tank. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to plumb it into my existing system. It's a possibility if I go down to the basement, which is where I'm bringing my question. Um, I live in rural Maine. I have a well. I have a septic. Um, an underground basement that stays pretty much 55 to 63. Um, okay. Any thoughts about having tanks down here? Um, well, I mean, 55 to 63 is a pretty good wine cellar. I don't know if you're a wino type, but uh, uh, if, if you are, you know, you may be giving up some wine cellar space. It's a great temperature for wine. Um, the thing about such a cool basement, Robert, uh, is that it's basically a chiller. It's basically running your tank through a chiller because it is so cool down there. Now, if you're in Maine, you probably don't have a heat problem. You're probably more likely to have a heat problem, so to speak, uh, in the sense that you're trying to get water in. Now, by the physics, it takes just as much effort to cool a tank than it does to heat up a tank, but it's much easier to heat a tank than it is to chill a tank. Adding a heater is an easy thing to do. Adding a chiller, not so easy. You have heat issues. You probably have to plumb it in. So my only concern with what you're talking about, Robert, is that it um, it's going to act as a big chiller. If you already have your sump in the basement, then you've likely already experienced this. You've likely already dealt with this. If you had a frag tank, then it could add extra chilling capabilities because you have more surface area. You may have more water evaporation down there because it's drier. So those are the types of things I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about a basement frag tank. But if you already have your sump down there, you probably already addressed the issue in terms of needing to heat it. Uh, good luck with that. I hope you're staying safe in Maine. Um, I haven't had a lobster in a long time. I know that's a stereotype, but uh, man, that just jogged my memory. That really sounds good. All right, we're going <clears> to <throat> roll up to Canada. Uh, Scott B. is holding down the fort uh, for the Canadians tonight because uh, Simon is uh, MIA. All right, uh, have at it, Scott B. Evening, Mark. How are you, sir? Doing good, doing good. Getting lots of yard work done with some nice weather finally. Yard work? It's yep. only May. You guys are out of the snow in Canada? Yeah, Sandy actually got a suntan today. She's burnt. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. Well, let's talk fish tanks. What do you got going on? Oh, just uh, thought it might be beneficial for listeners as well but uh, on the quarantine tank uh aspect with you know the second tank but particularly the the frag tank and we talked about, about this a bit but the the need to separate a quarantine frag tank and i get obviously you want to have that plumbed in your whole system but could you maybe talk about the equipment one would need and how to best plumb uh, your frag tank, so you could make it in, in a way independent, standalone. If you know when you want to quarantine some frags, you might get in. All right, so let's talk about the quarantine frag tanks. Keeping a quarantine frag tank or a quarantine tank for corals is a whole different ball of wax than keeping a quarantine tank for fish. Fish quarantine tanks can be very basic because fish don't need a lot, especially compared to corals. With corals, you need to keep your water parameters very stable. It can be harder in a smaller system. 
you need to have good water quality, so you're likely going to need a skimmer, uh, a medium reactor to do that, and you're going to need better lighting. So it's a whole different ball of wax. So if I can have a quarantine system that's frag quarantine system tied into my display tank, there's a give and take here. One, as soon as you tie it into your display tank and any water runs through it, it's no longer a quarantine tank. Now, it may be quarantine in the sense that a frag needs a place to recover, you need to get it away from a nippy fish. That's a different definition in my mind of quarantine. Quarantine, like we're all going through right now, is separate, isolated, don't touch, you can look, but that's it. So if you're plumbing it in, then you're losing that aspect of quarantine. But what in your case, if you wanted to make a quarantine frag tank, a quarantine system for coral, that goes into your display tank, and then you can take it offline. How would you set it up so that it can still be as stable as possible? Okay. What you need to do then is build your quarantine frag tank, your quarantine coral system, as a true standalone system. You say, if I turn off the flow, the in and the out from my main display tank, this system needs to stand on its own, ready to go. So that means to me, I'm gonna have a protein skimmer, I'm gonna have a media reactor, even if it's just one, I'm gonna have an auto top off because auto topping off or topping off by hand uh, is not much fun. I do that with three tanks in this room. So all the things that I would think about for a display tank, I'm pretty much thinking about for a coral quarantine standalone type system. How would I plumb that? I'm going to push water into the um, from the display tank into the frag tank. It's going to fall down through a sump. Sump that has a skimmer sitting in it, and then that sump's going to drain into my main display tank. And I'm going to have valves on all that so I can turn it off and completely isolate it. Would I do it that way? If I'm going to have a frag tank that's going to be there for quarantine, and I'm thinking about this with my own fish room. It's really got to be something that's standalone. I don't want any valves to accidentally get opened by someone who happens to walk by or maybe your tank sitter turned something wrong. So I want that thing to be completely separate in every sense of the word. And then when I'm thinking about that separate system, whether I'm going to plumb it in or not, it's got to be basically its own standalone system on its own. It doesn't have to be anything else. It's just, it could be its own tank. It could function on its own if you turn off the flow or if you have it standing on its own, it's ready to go. So would I have the skimmer in there? I would have the skimmer in there and probably I would have it running so that it's broken in, but I wouldn't run it at much of a setting. It might run for two hours a day. Uh, the media reactors, okay, so I wouldn't have that running because that's defeating the purpose, but things like the skimmer, which needs to have maybe a week or even two to break in, if you isolated that thing, I would wanna have it going because I wanna try to keep everything uh, as stable as possible and make it easier on you as well. If you got the space to do it, awesome. Fantastic uh, to get that done. All right, let's see. Let's take one more live question and then we'll do one more uh, text question. Now, um, for Nicholas, you had a question um, about quarantine dragonets. I'm gonna keep this on topic, uh, Nicholas. So why don't you do this, email me your question, because I want to answer that. I want to get your answer to this. Someone earlier had a question about a hair algae. Make sure you email me that as well uh, so I can get you handled. I just want to keep it on topic tonight. Let's go to Bruce. Uh, Bruce F., you're live, buddy. Well, oh, um, hey, Mark. I was the one with the hair algae uh, question, oh. so I can, I can email you if okay, that great. helps. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks, uh, thanks for reminding me. All right. Let's see, let's, uh, let's see, CJ. All right, CJ Jones, talk to me, buddy. Are you with us, CJ? I'm here. There he is. I'm here, Mark. You got a question for me? I have quite a few questions. I'm a newbie, so, and everything has been very informative for me. Um, and I know you're talking about second tanks, so I'm going to try to stick with the second tanks for right now. I have emailed you my other questions. But okay. for the second tanks, and we're going to talk about the quarantine, um, yep. is it is it necessary and good for fish to have a second quarantine from your fish upon getting them from the um, fish stores and whatnot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Your fish quarantine tank has to be separate. And absolutely, I quarantine anything that comes into my tank. 
period. Um, your new BCJ, go back and watch the show. Uh, I think it's labeled here. Let's go look. Um, I did a show where I got to eat crow and um, let's see, because I didn't quarantine, I didn't used to do it, and then I got nailed uh, by not quarantining. But no, you sorry, just to make it. Uh, let's see. Hey, nope. Uh, I did a show. I want to make sure I get you the uh, title right, so that you. Here you go. This is a show you want to watch, CJ. This is me, um, where I get to go on YouTube and talk about why I'm draining my tank because I didn't quarantine and disease got into it and nuked nearly everything in the tanks. So absolutely quarantine. Watch the show. I'll tell you more about it. And that quarantine system has to be separate. As soon as you plumb in a fish quarantine system or a coral quarantine system into your main display tank, it's no longer a quarantine in the sense of keeping disease out. Then it's just more of a hospital tank, a place for fish to rest, or corals to rest, but they're all sharing the same water. All right, great question. Thanks for the live question, CJ. Glad that everything is helpful. Congrats on being a newbie into the hobby. Uh, lots to learn about, um, but you're in the right place. All right, let's see here. Who has a, well, we have no more new text questions. All right, let's take one more live question. And then uh, I'm going to let everyone go. All right, Walid, you have been uh, having your hand up for a while. You like the kid in the back of the class jumping up and down with your hand up. <laughs> have at it. Thank you for your support. Uh, I want to ask you three questions. Uh, uh, the first question is, what are the reasons for cyanobacteria in the reef tanks? What are the causes? Because uh, I'm battling with cyano for maybe one year. They goes and back and goes by medication. I can remove them, but what are the reasons so I can prevent them to come in the future? So, uh, um, well, do you have any questions about second tanks? I'm just keeping it on topic for now. You can email me your other questions, but do you have any about? Yes, uh, I have a room size uh, 6.5 feet by 11.4 feet. What is the suggested uh, suggested uh, size for a tank for this room? So your room is 11, that's called 11 feet by 6 feet, roughly? Yeah, 6, six, yeah, six by 11, you can say. Okay. Or in meters, 3.5 meter by 2 meter. I was going to say, uh, the, the only measurement system that actually makes any sense. All right, so Wally wants to know, I've got a 6 foot by 11 foot room. What size tank do you need? Okay, so here's how I would look at this. Probably if you had me up for an initial tank build consultation, because so I was going to build you a tank, first thing I would think about is what size do you have in mind? You may have always wanted an eight foot tank or a 400 gallon tank or 500 gallon tank. Then I would look at it, we'd lay out some measurements and say, look, here's, you got 11 feet, let's say you want a 450 gallon tank for an example, that tank's gonna be eight feet long. So that's gonna give you Three, so a foot and a half on either side. Then I'm going to look at it and say, okay, there's some level of this of what do you want the tank to do in the room for you? Do you want to walk in the room and be like, oh, fish tank? Or do you want to walk in the room and be like, oh, the fish tank fits nicely into this room? Or maybe you want to walk in the room and be like, there's my little fish tank in the corner doing his thing, and I have the rest of the room to do something else. That's a preference thing. It's really about what kind of statement or not statement do you want the tank to make? So let's just say that you want the tank to make a big statement because everyone likes bigger tanks. Bigger is better. Then I'm going to start looking at it and going, okay, where do I have to put the filtration on this thing? Is it going to be underneath? Can it be in a fish room behind or in a garage or a basement or whatever? Then I want to make sure I have room for the filtration for what it needs to do, the size of everything underneath the tank or in the fish room and the other room. So I then have to start thinking about maybe we want a big tank, but we don't have the capabilities to put the filtration somewhere else that would need the necessary equipment for a large tank. Or if we do put it underneath, realize that you're going to have to be crouching down. You may have to be doing a water change that way. It's not necessarily bad. It's just a given a tank. These are all the variables I start thinking about when I'm laying out a tank in a room. Um, and the other thing I like to do is say, okay, let's talk about it all here. 
this over here is catching my eye. Let's just change this thing and put it over there. Um, I, I'm always brainstorming things with clients when I come and visit them. So when you may be thinking about putting it on this wall, don't be afraid to turn around and think about it, put it somewhere else. When you're just planning it, it doesn't cost you anything. Play with different scenarios. Don't just think about putting it in one place. And you got 11 feet by six foot room, but you got space, man. That's a nice size. I mean, six feet isn't necessarily that wide. So while I like three foot tanks, that gives you three feet of sitting or standing area. Personally, I wouldn't have a saltwater tank where I couldn't sit and look at it. Standing at it, looking at it, it's okay. But I like to sit down at things and really sit there and take it in. Spend a lot of time in front of the tank. So in your case, I may go 24 inches wide. Uh, so therefore, you have room for any kind of sitting area, comfortable sitting area, where you're not feel like you're like right up in front of the tank where you have to enjoy it. So that's given 11 feet by five by six feet. Wally, that's how I would think about uh, in terms of placing a tank there, what size tank. Some of those variables are just personal tastes. Um, but if you can go bigger and you want to make that kind of statement in the room, and it doesn't like crowd your room, like I wouldn't have a bigger tank, but I couldn't also have somewhere to sit comfortably, like just a give and take there. Just remember within six months, it's going to probably feel small. And if you're thinking, yeah, I should have gone another foot, do it. Maybe you got to save up for some amount, of, a little short amount of time to actually get there. Do it. Things like you may need, like lights, you can always add it in later. The tank, you're going to do it once and set it there. Because uh, moving and upgrading, even upgrading a tank, especially the tank in the same spot, not that much fun. With that, thanks everyone for being here. Have a great rest of your night. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Looks like we're hitting the downward slope on this COVID thing. Uh, but let's stick with it. Let's keep those numbers down. Stay safe, everybody. I will catch you next week. <music>